Okay. Uh, well, thanks very much, and thank you for making that effort at the end of a long, grueling day. I mean, even this final session, you haven't had a break for about two, three hours, and I'm all that's between you and the rather excellent pubs of this rather fine city. Um, do stay with me, uh, and I'm going to try and uh, show you a bit about um, what we at the BBC have been doing with Doctor Who and gaming, uh, and talk a little bit more about why the BBC's uh, doing anything gaming at all. Um, and then uh, if you've got any questions at the end, hopefully I'll be able to answer. Um, but uh, apologi apologies in advance for the cheesy opening line, but as I'm in a film theatre, I couldn't resist saying, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be the Doctor. Um, I loved watching it uh, on a Saturday afternoon um, after Grandstand, uh, maybe with the Pink Panther sandwiched uh, between Grandstand and Doctor Who, which was just fantastic entree. Uh, round at my mate's house, uh, often with a bag of chips, uh, but that was only the start of it. Because watching then turned into playing. And we'd play at being the monsters, at imitating the voices, at pretending to be, I don't know, sea devils, Daleks, Cybermen. We'd turn sticks into screwdrivers, and we'd turn cupboards into the TARDIS. Now, uh, kids today are a little bit more inventive than we were. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example here of someone who's not just made a Lego world for the Doctor, but has then turned it into a film and has posted it on YouTube. David Tennant and Donna, by the way. And that's a Dalek. Cancer Harkness. Some pigs. Meat, shit, flattened. Stronger every time. only a fan, as are my children. Um, and they're a little bit lazier than this guy, but they're no less excited about the opportunity to play the doctor. Uh, and when they found him in their own favorite playground, which is Little Big Planet, uh, they, were, uh, they came to see me, Dad, Dad, you gotta come and see this Doctor Who's in Little Big Planet. And there are several uh, um, user-generated levels of Little Big Planet, which has kept my kids occupied for about 15 months or something like that, the best buy I've ever made for them. Um, and uh, here's just one of them. Again, wonderfully inventive. When I, um, when I showed that to my uh, little boy, he said, I know that guy, he's chimpanzee, and apparently he plays with him all the time. He's, he's some uh, quite cool dude on Little Big Planet, apparently. Um, anyway, people have always found ways to play with the Doctor and to reimagine the universe of Doctor Who. Um, but why should the BBC get involved in building a Doctor Who game? Indeed, some of you might be wondering why the BBC's playing around with games at all, and why aren't we just making TV and radio? 
So in this presentation, I'm going to try and give some answers into that question and a few insights into the production process that's brought the Doctor Who adventure games to life. And then at the end, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of the new uh, Doctor Who episode, episode three, which we're launching tomorrow. Um, but firstly, a bit of the BBC's history in games. We've got a long history in games uh, and in, ex in experimenting with different forms of interactivity that enhance our traditional TV and radio output, but also move us into new areas of delivery of public service content. Uh, our children's area recognised early on that um, enabling its audiences to play was no longer just an optional extra, it was an absolute imperative if they were to stay relevant to that audience. Uh, you'll know uh, better than any audience I've ever spoken to about the um, ability of learning through play to deliver the educate part of the BBC's inform, educate and entertain mission. And there's been a rush to investigate the potential for new forms of drama, new forms of storytelling, which the internet has enabled. Uh, some which we've done tied to existing shows like Spooks, and others like Signs of Life, which were at the time bold attempts to launch entirely new brands, uh, which started on the web. Now by 2008, this had grown to encompass quite a wide range of bespoke gaming activity on BBC Co UK. But if we're honest, not all of it had uh, the, the quality standards that we might have wanted, uh, and sometimes the public service value was dubious. Uh, so we've changed course since then, and we've rationalised the number of games we're doing. Uh, we're tying them in more closely to the public purposes of the BBC. We're trying to make them more distinctive, and we're trying to focus our resources on fewer, bigger, better projects of real scale and ambition. And that's where this project came in. And we were also keen to develop a new relationship with the games industry itself, who'd sometimes been sort of forced to watch in from the outside as the BBC had spent money on in-house teams or working with digital agencies, uh, and experimented with quite small-scale games. Um, but we were particularly excited by the potential to try out these new forms of storytelling and see what happened if we married our own expertise in TV, drama and storytelling with that of the games industry in enabling people to play and interact. So we brought together some of the best writing talent that we have and some of the best production talent we have in the BBC. Stephen Moffat, the showrunner for Doctor Who and the BBC Wales production team who create a fantastic uh, series of Doctor Who. But we were helped by world-class games developers. We brought in this guy, uh, you, you'll know him, do you? Uh, so that's Charles Cecil, um, who uh, was introduced to us by a guy called Rick Gibson uh, from a company called Games Investor, who I've been doing some work with. Uh, and he really helped shepherd us through quite an unfamiliar world uh, for us. And um, he helped us through the pitching process, which was won by Sumo Digital, who again were an absolute joy to work with. Um, and we were hoping that in this instance, learning from the experience of previous attempts we'd had in playing around with games, such as Signs of Life, where maybe we hadn't exploited our existing brands, our existing IP enough, and therefore, while we'd done something creatively interesting, the audience numbers hadn't been that great, this time it was time to put our money where our mouth was and take our biggest brand and hopefully by marrying the, our creators with those of the games industry, come up with something really interesting and new in terms of narrative. So, um, in May this year, whoops, we launched the first of what is going to be four free downloadable games for PC and Mac. And it's something the BBC had never done before, certainly on this scale, uh, in which our audiences could control the action and they could become the doctor. And the kind of sort of creative buzz that threw up from this was fantastic because the way in which the TV production team felt liberated by the ability to, for example, destroy Trafalgar Square, uh, and um, which they did in the uh, first episode, which was called City of the Daleks, um, it was a real eye-opener for them, the opportunities they now had to just go into entirely new environments, 
entirely new uh, situations and take stories and take characters uh, to new places. Uh, but also learning from these fantastic guys at Sumo, from Charles, about what it means to let the audience play, to engage, uh, and to interact. Um, another thing that we'd never really done justice to on, on TV was the Daleks' home planet of Scaro, uh, which was first visited by the very first Doctor, um, and subsequently um, it, by the fourth Doctor in uh, Destiny of the Daleks, it was, the first episode when Davros appeared. Uh, and I actually got the clip out of that and had a look at it. And um, it was basically a waste ground uh, that they'd you know, filmed as Scaro, you know, this uh, legendary planet where the Daleks came from. But, of course, putting this in the hands of Charles and Sumo, uh, we were able actually to come up with something that did rather more justice to um, uh, the world that spawned uh, this, this race. Um, and um, they, they basically went to Stephen Moffat himself for guidance on, right, how do we realise this world? What's it look like? What's it feel like? And uh, apparently the guidance he gave them was one word. It's brutal. But from that, they created this manifestation of Skyro, and that is now what TV's going to have to live up to if it ever decides to take the Doctor back there. Episode 2 brought back the Cybermen, uh, who were discovered in the Arctic, uh, which again was an exciting new environment for us to take uh, the fans uh, and enable them to explore. I'm going to show you a little clip uh, of this episode. Where are we? The Arctic Circle somewhere. Be careful, Chisholm. Whatever that is, it's been buried in this ice for millennia. It's an earthquake. I mean, an ice quake. Oh my god. Um, so I should say that in, in this sort of production process, in this marrying of games world and TV worlds, it wasn't just the TV guys who were, you know, really having their eyes opened and, um, and having enormous fun at playing in this new environment. The sumo guys could not believe their luck at getting hold of the Doctor Who universe and being able to play around with it, including the ability to create new monsters. So that monster you saw at the end there is um, uh, what's now known as a cyber slave. Uh, which is a sort of uh, you know, lower tier, lower strata of uh, uh, Cyberman uh, society, uh, and again now becomes part of the Who mythology. And what, why I've shown you a few of the iterations of the design there is just um, the, the level of detail and, and kicking about between Sheffield, where Sumo base, and Wales on how these things could be manifested, what a Doctor Who monster was allowed to look like. These first manifestations were deemed to be a bit too sort of World of Warcraft, a bit too scary, not quite within the Doctor Who brand, but they got there by sticking a boiler suit uh, on it. Um, and um, you also saw in that, um, in that clip there uh, the cyber pets. And again, uh, the writers and the production team had great fun in bringing back um, a monster that uh, was first seen, and in fact last seen, uh, in Patrick Troughton days back in the 60s, uh, which is uh, a, little, uh, a little cyber pet thing that basically comes and bites you and, and starts turning you into uh, a Cyberman. Um, and uh, this has now been uh, updated, brought back into the sort of Cyberman mythology, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see this now appearing in the TV show. And it's this kind of sort of uh, synergy and, and working between the areas that we've been talking about for quite some time, but really feels like the guys started to crack in this one. <laughs> 